Good morning. Father God, we would ask you that you would open our eyes this morning so that we could see Jesus, so that we can uh, reach out and touch you. Lord, we know that you love us and, and that you want the best for us. And so, Lord, as we open your word this morning, we just pray that you would open our eyes. We pray this in your name. Amen. The uh, epistle lesson for today is uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, it's already been read for you this morning, so I'm not going to uh, read through it again. But if you have your Bible handy, uh, I'd encourage you to keep your finger there because we'll be referring to it from time to time. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, I'd encourage you to, to pause the video at this point and read Hebrews chapter 11, uh, but just be sure to come back and hit play when you're done. Uh, uh, each of the scripture texts chosen for today deal with the topic of faith. Faith is a word that we hear in a lot of contexts, uh, both within and outside of the church. Some people are said to be faithful friends. Uh, some people have been devastated by unfaithful spouses. Uh, people might encourage you to keep the faith. Some people use phrases like people of faith or communities of faith to denote people that are involved with religious beliefs or activities. Now to some, faith is an antiquated term, an idea whose time has come and gone, that as we as a society have moved beyond what they call superstition and into scientific reason. But that very idea is itself a statement of faith faith in the science and reason of man to make sense of the world around us. So this morning we're going to spend a few minutes exploring the topic of faith, and we're going to make some biblical distinctions between saving faith and all other kinds of faith. The word faith comes from the Latin word fides. Uh, it means trust or confidence. And if you open your dictionary, you'll see several definitions. I'll just read you a few of them. Uh, confidence or trust in a person or thing. Belief that is not based on proof. Belief in God or in the doctrines or teaching of religion. A system of religion or belief. Or an obligation of loyalty or fidelity to a person. But our lesson, our epistle lesson this morning defines it like this. Now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. This is a little stronger than the dictionary definition, and that's because it's referring to a specific kind of faith, what scripture refers to elsewhere as saving faith or living faith. And I want you to note some important words in this definition. First it says, faith is the certainty of things hoped for. Some other translations use the word assurance or substance. Uh, instead of certainty. But the meaning is that this is something sure. It's something that's not just wishful thinking. It's real. It's just not here yet. The second part of that definition calls it a proof of things not seen. And some translate this word proof as conviction or evidence. Again, not merely a hope so, but a solid knowledge that something truly exists, even though it cannot yet be seen. It's like a, a child that's been promised a trip to the lake, and they have absolutely no doubt that that's going to happen. Why are they so sure? Well, it's because they believe that the one who made the promise can and will deliver on it. And this is the kind of faith that we see throughout our text in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, that chapter is sometimes called the Hall of Faith. Uh, it's like a, a who's who of people throughout the Old Testament who exemplified faith in a living God. These were people for whom faith was more than wishful thinking, more than a hopeful desire, more than a bumper sticker. Their faith was a life-changing conviction. And as we read this chapter, we see many different kinds of people with many different backgrounds and experiences now, we read only a small portion of Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. I'd encourage you to read the whole chapter sometime this week. And if you do, you will see many more examples, some by name, others just by groups. And I suspect 
that the reason that out of all the millions of people who had ever lived, these people and their stories are preserved for us in scripture because of their example. Because these are people whose faith both inspires and convicts us to this day. In fact, verse four of chapter 11, speaking about Abel says that through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So let's look at uh, some of these examples. Abel, who brought the best of his flock as a sacrifice to God. Noah spent 120 years with his family building a giant boat because he believed that God would send the flood, just as he said. Abraham, who left his home to go where God wanted him to go without even knowing where that was because that's what God told him to do. I want you to note here that it doesn't say that these things that they did made them righteous. Instead, it says that it was their faith that was counted as righteousness. These were not perfect people, but they put their trust in God. And so on and on through this chapter, we see example after example of people who believed and obeyed God, even though that that, that they were asked to do didn't make much sense from a human perspective. And now here's the kicker. In verse 13, it says, all these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen and welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So after all they did to follow God's commands, after believing in God as they did, each of them died before the fullness of that promise came about. So were they crazy? Were they misguided in some way? No, because they knew that the promise will one day be fulfilled. You see, the common thread that runs through all of these stories in chapter 11 is not just that they had an unshakable faith. It's that their faith was placed in an unshakable God. There's a popular opinion that's expressed by many people, you hear this all over, that all roads lead to heaven. That it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you sincerely believe it. That somehow just having enough faith, being a, a spiritual person, sampling some beliefs from here and some from there, cafeteria style, will make everything come out okay in the end. But that's not what the scripture says. And if you think about it, it doesn't even make rational sense. I want you to think of faith like, like a rope that you use to tie up your boat at the dock. It's only really of value if it's tied to something that's worthy of being trusted. And I don't care if you have the world's strongest rope or you tie the best knots in the world. If you tie your boat up to a canoe that's floating next to you, it's not gonna do you any good because you're not connected to something that can't be moved. Faith is like that. You can sincerely believe in something or someone. You can strongly believe, but be sincerely lost. Because the object of your faith, uh, what you believe, is what's most important in whom you believe. It's the difference between a living, saving faith and just wishful thinking. Uh, Psalm 33 is one of the other readings that was designated for this Sunday. Uh, and it says, starting at verse 16, the king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not rescued by great strength. A horse is a false hope of victory, nor does it rescue anyone by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who wait for his faithfulness to rescue their souls from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. In Psalm 20, a few chapters before, it says much the same thing. It says, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
Many years ago, uh, I needed a part for my car. And uh, I didn't have much money. I didn't want to pay for a brand new one. So I went to one of those junkyards that uh, you can go in and, and you can pull what you need off of one of their junk cars. And on the wall behind the counter in that junkyard was a sign. And in big letters it said, in God we trust. And then in smaller letters below it, it said, all others pay cash. And I, I think there's some real spiritual truth there. Because anything and anyone in whom you put your trust, other than God himself, will ultimately fail us. Maybe not because they intend to, but because they're not perfect or holy or eternal. People die or fail us. Things rust or get lost or stolen. Only God can be trusted to never change, to always keep his word, always be there, never move. So you might be thinking to yourself, I'm not Noah. <laughs> I'm not Abraham. I'm not Abel. How can I have that kind of strong saving faith that we see throughout Hebrews chapter 11? Well, here's the best part. God knows that on our own, we cannot come with, up with the strength to have faith like this. So he freely gives the gift of faith through the Holy Spirit to all who will ask in belief. Paul lays this out for us in Romans uh, chapter 10, starting at verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for the same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. If you've heard that message and you believe, then you can be assured that he has saved you, not because your faith is so great, but because he is. That verse that I read a few minutes ago, uh, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, was something that, that came home powerfully to me oh, you know, when I was a kid. And, and I believe it was at a Bible camp where someone read that verse and it just it struck me that uh, that means everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So if you struggle with the thought that your faith is too small, remember that it's God who gives you that faith in the first place. It's not about you. It's all about him. Uh, about 40 years ago, uh, Amy Grant released a song called Arms of Love. And uh, many of you may have heard it. Uh, part of the first verse says, It's hard to walk on shifting sand. I miss the rock and find there's nowhere left to stand. I start to cry. Lord, please help me. Raise my hands so you can pick me up. And that one phrase has always stuck with me. Lord, please. Please help me raise my hands so you can pick me up. We don't even have the strength in ourselves to even reach out to God. But thankfully, our salvation doesn't depend on our strength or our ability to somehow gin up enough faith by ourselves and in ourselves. It depends only on the one who's waiting for us to ask, who never fails, and who's worthy of our trust. So if you've never put your faith in God, now is the time. This faith comes through hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. You've heard that word plainly this morning. You've heard the examples of those people long ago. And you've heard the word declare that if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You can do that right here and now and accept the gift of faith and salvation that God wants to freely give you. And then you can come to the Lord's table here in a few moments in faith, forgiven, thanking God for his salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the assurance that you give us that if we come to you, that you will forgive all our sins, that you will give us that gift of faith, that you will strengthen us and lift us up. Lord, we pray that you would, would lift up our hands so that you can pick us up. And we pray these things in your name and for your sake. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. For more information or to contact us, please visit us on the web at mnvalleychurch.org or find us on Facebook at Minnesota Valley Church.